we're going to talk today about the five W's and one H of communicating with the HAI group. And that's going to be the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, and the how. HAI Group um, is a family of companies. Uh, we are strictly uh, in the position and, and, and space of dealing with affordable uh, housing as well as public housing. We offer a variety of insurance products and services for this particular industry. And if you'd like to know exactly what we're capable and uh, available to do, you can learn more at www.housingcenter.com. I am JB Smith. I am a senior risk control consultant uh, with the risk control and consulting department here at HAI. Um, I came to HAI approximately seven years ago. Um, my particular uh, area of focus within the organization is uh, as a risk control person, I do training. Um, our department um, does a lot of different training with member agencies. Um, my background is uh, in dealing with a or functioning as a housing authority risk control manager um, with a uh, housing authority located in Virginia. Um, I'm retired law enforcement. I've probably been doing training for uh, probably the last 20 years. Um, and I really enjoy um, providing those uh, types of services to the members uh, to also include inspection and consultation. So that is my role with HAI. And I have today uh, two of my colleagues with me, um, Jen Humphrey. Jen, would you mind introducing yourself? Hi, I'm Jennifer Humphrey. I joined HAI approximately six years ago. I've been in the insurance industry this year, it's 26 years. Um, I work in the account services department. We have the business development analyst in our department account service representatives, account specialists, and the account executives. Your account executive is your point of contact for all matters insurance. Each state has an account executive assigned to them. And along with our proprietary insurance, we also work with other partners to obtain insurance for our members that we don't write here. Could be an excess liability policy, cyber policy, um, basically anything in insurance we could go out and get for you that we don't write here in HAI Group. Well, that brings us to Phil. I'm Philip Zwick. I've been in HAI Group for nearly four years. Um, I've spent about 35 years in the insurance industry. Um, and working in different uh, publicly traded companies and now HAI, a mutual company. So who should you be communicating with at HAI Group? Well, the reality is, and the reason that my two colleagues are here, is we, uh, as a collective group, um, are who you should be dealing with um, from risk control, account services, underwriting, and claims. Um, typically, you won't uh, be in contact with our underwriting uh, colleagues or our claims colleagues, but I thought it was good for um, Phil to join us today to kind of answer to and speak to some of those, um, how shall I say, higher level uh, underwriting um, concepts and things that uh, you as a member uh, may come across. So we all play a really particular and precise role in the administration of our insurance services and products here with HAI. So now let's talk about the what. Um, there, uh, what are the benefits of communicating changes with HAI group? Well, potentially it's, it's allowing you to save money um, from things that, uh, you know, when you remove a property or you've sold a property, you've demolished a property, those are all benefits that help us with the what. Mitigating preventable risk, that's where my department comes in and, and, and helps with uh, that particular um, type of thing. We can help you through issues as you change what you own, um, what you have still standing, or if you have vacant properties, those kinds of things uh, we can help 
you ensure that you have the right types of coverage for the situations that you're faced with as you move along in developing, redeveloping, uh, or reducing uh, portfolio assets. Claims. Again, what are the benefits of communicating the issues of claims with HAI Group? Um, you can report a claim right away. That helps in the long term. Uh, there may be instances where you are at the start of a process and you have that first piece of the puzzle for a claim that you know about. Um, you can actually continue to report the different things that you're finding um, on a particular claim so that down the line, we have all the pieces to the puzzle and we can, we're better suited and equipped to deal with a claim if litigation uh, may arise out of it. Um, you may even want to just file an incident as an incident only because there's been no real demand or claim placed yet uh, for something. So it's an opportunity for you to gather and collect and report what information you have so that if there were litigation or a situation to evolve that um, turned into a claim, we'd have those pieces that we would need to be a better, uh, in, in a better position to help you uh, go through those things. Additionally, property surveys um, are a great benefit to speak directly to the department that I work for, having us come in and point out those critical places within your portfolio of properties or your business model uh, and your business operations, we can assist by being able to give you some consulting uh, on those particular areas of what you do. So it's just important to understand that property surveys can help um, make sure that you're able to um, put yourself in a better uh, position to reduce exposures um, and uh, really protect yourself against those risks that can bring about claims. JP, I yeah. would also probably add that by having uh, co communication with HAI, you're going to have the coverage that you need. Um, and we will find ways to um, provide coverages that you need that may not have existed for you or which we were unaware of in the past. And so knowing about it is going to help us understand and, and make sure that your coverage fits the right way. If you're uh, dealing with um, situations with uh, builders uh, or, or buildings and property developments, new and upgraded equipment, changes that uh, may happen to your rent collection process, new security operations, um, new commercial operations, all of those things um, may have an impact uh, on your policy, your rates, uh, and just again, how you are going to uh, engage and, and, and communicate with and collaborate here with us. Uh, even recreational equipment such as fitness centers and splash pads, playgrounds, all of those things are a part of the businesses that you guys as members uh, engage in. Um, so those are the things that we want to make sure that um, we get communicated to us and we can give you some guidance and some assistance in making sure that you reduce or remove altogether exposures associated with those activities. So this brings us to the why. Why is it so important to reach out to HAI Group when making changes? Well, to help us answer the why, we have Jen that will provide us with an experience that she's had over the course of her time here. I had a recent scenario which involved all departments that are here being represented today. Um, the risk control department, um, the account services department, and underwriting. I received an email from the risk con control consultant, copied on correspondence she had with one of our members, asking about a survey, going out to do an inspection. The insured's response, the member's response was, is it because we just changed our entire portfolio over to a new program. And that's when she got me involved because we had no idea that this occurred. So 
during this change, they've changed their name, um, which changed the type of insurance we may be able to offer them because our public housing policies are written through a separate program than our affordable program. So I had to get involved with him, ask for their um, contracts with HUD, what they did in order to change their name, what process they went through. Is there an organizational chart that is going to explain to me how the ownership has changed? When there is no change in, when it's just a change of name, people feel like they don't need to contact us because they're not, it's not affecting their insurance. But truly it is because we're insuring the public housing as ABC agency. And when you change it to XYZ, even though all parties remain the same, you're changing the contract you have with us with the insurance. So after I got all the information I needed, I had to go to my underwriting department and say, how do you guys want to move with this? This is something that we can keep in our public housing platform, or does it have to be moved to an affordable platform? If there was a claim or something that happened without us knowing this, and the party that was brought to suit was the new named insured that HAI knows nothing about, you could put yourself in a situation where we're questioning the ownership and who the named insured is under the policy. So my takeaway is even if it's just a name change, uh, give us a call. If you don't think it's something that's big or that warrants a call to your account services department, you should still call us whenever you're making changes, whether it be renovations, name changes, whatever you're doing in your authority that causes you to complete applications, get lenders involved, you should really contact your account services representative and we can walk you through it um, just to make sure you're insured adequately and you don't have any issues if a claim arises. So, so Jen, what I'm hearing and what I'm taking away is that uh, for our members, this could be a costly situation should a claim arise that a, a member who really bona fide believes that the fact that they kind of rearranged their name or changed their name didn't really materially affect the policy, which could ultimately cost them money um, to correct or to answer to any type of claim uh, for personal injury or contractual obligations because they've changed the dynamics of how they do business. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes, it is. Okay. So it's, it's very important, even the smallest thing that you're doing, that you give us a call. If it doesn't affect your insurance, we're going to tell you that. But if it does, it's better to err on the safe side to make sure that we can protect you as much as we can, but we can't do that without you guys communicating with us to let us know what's going on in your agencies. So technically, in a nutshell, I guess that making sure that their policy is in place with the correct information, the correct legal information, will keep them from putting other agency assets uh, in jeopardy uh, through a uh, situation of litigation. Yes. Well, I, I, I truly appreciate that information um, and working with, you know, it kind of shows how we work in-house together. So with that, you know, I'd like to trans over, transition over to Wynn and talk about when is it appropriate for a member to contact the HAI group? And I think that, Phil, you had an extraordinary situation and I'd like you to explain what you came in came up against uh, here in the recent. Thanks JB. So just as a as a place to begin I guess uh, for people that aren't really familiar with underwriters um, we describe you know a little bit about what underwriters do. In the simplest sense underwriters are used by insurance companies to help us manage the books of risk that they have. So generically, we collect information, we analyze patterns of loss, we consider exposures, 
and working with the information that we've developed, um, we basically work to document risk exposures and price insurance policies and uh, develop the correct terms and conditions for a particular policy. And uh, we look for exposures that may not have been known or previously developed, which is another reason why it's really important um, that the communication be um, very strong with our risk control people and also our account service reps. The scenario that I'd like to describe is that will help you understand perhaps a little bit more about what we need and how we go about working. Um, and it was a real life example that occurred um, in December of 2021. Um, we received a note from our member um, in mid-December 2021 indicating that they were purchasing a building. Uh, the closing was expected to occur in the last day of July. The member's policies renewed January 1st. We were requested to provide both property under our HAPI program because it was a public housing authority and also a general liability policy um, th through our HARG program. The submission included um, the local tax assessor's card to give us some of the property information. Um, that information consisted of uh, the following bits of information. The building was built in the 1970s. Substantial renovations had occurred to the building from 2000 onward to 2016. And these totaled at least several million dollars based on the indicated permits. What were called additions, remodels, and renovations included, um, but weren't limited to sprinkler systems, roof, and HVAC systems. So those were the building mechanical systems. Um, the building was a senior care building and it would be elder units after purchase. The total square footage was 125,000 square feet, so a large building. And the assessor's document had provided a market value calculation for what the building was said to be worth. So what was missing? Um, what was the construction of the building? That was an important bit of information that we needed. How many stories was the building? Um, what did the member pay for the building? And also, what's the current use of the building, whether it was occupied or vacant? Ultimately, working with our risk control department and using other sources of information, we were able to determine that the building had in fact been vacant for a period of time. This raised additional questions for underwriting. Did the utility services remain operable? Would a sprinkler system remain operable and functional as required? What security controls existed to keep unauthorized persons out of the building? We learned that the member would renovate the building to make it habitable. The plan was to dedicate first floor space to an office and then convert all other floor space in the building. It was seven or eight stories to elder units later. The issues that we had from an underwriting perspective were that the valuation is, is, was a concern for this building because it was a vacant building. Unlike those occupied buildings on property happy policies, which require building values be based on the replacement cost, the cost to replace damaged covered property um, with, with identical property used for the same purpose without deduction for depreciation which is the standard, vacant buildings are generally valued at the, the amount that the member paid for the building, which typically represents the building's actual cash value, which is replacement cost, less a deduction for depreciation. Finally, the housing plus endorsement, which is something that we add to all of the property um, policies written for public housing gives coverage and limits coverage to $2 million for newly acquired buildings that the, the member um, obtains during the per policy period. There was an interesting provision of this particular policy coverage form that indicates that the coverage is limited and that it only extends for 120 days um, from the date that the building is acquired or constructed 
or until you tell us uh, that the building has been um, purchased or obtained, how, however that occurs. And the final thing that we had with this one was that the uh, coverage does not go past the end of the policy period. This was interesting because in this case, the closing was at the end of the year. It just, just, just in fact, days short of the member's renewal and there was no coverage for that building because that coverage would not exist past the policy period um, had, the, had the member not told us. So it's really important in this case that we, that we get, um, uh, we have communication with our, with our members through our current service department so we can better understand your exposures and we really can understand what's going on. Um, as a corollary to that, we also like to get applications because those help us figure out where there may be uncovered exposure that we can work with account services to provide the coverage that you need, particularly in the case of a new exposure that we've not known about in the past. So Phil, let me ask this question. So when it comes to applications, why is it so vital and important? I mean, in general, uh, why is it really you know, I've heard that we, we get applications and, and sometimes they, they don't come in exactly as we planned. So what's the importance of having that application info um, in, in a little detail? Where, what do you use from it? What, what do you glean from applications? Well, we always, JB, we always look at all of the information and then a member supplies. And we're always looking at um, kind of checking what we know about a member's operation versus what we don't know about a member's operation. So we're always looking for things that are different or new or something that is um, perhaps not addressed in, in, in a coverage um, and correctly or, or uh, addressed um, in a way that we can provide the correct coverage that they need. So we're always looking at the applications. We want just to make sure that the information is accurate and that we still have a, um, a good understanding of what a member uh, does from year to year when, we, when we're when we involved with underwriting their renewals. So if they don't give you, first of all, if they, they don't return the application, um, that is problematic, but even more so with making sure that that the right coverage is there. And, and when you say the right coverage, could that be a, a situation where uh, a, a member reports that they have a, a particular building or community, but they've done some upgrades and or additions to the property and they don't disclose those fully? Um, could that provide an impact on your underwriting discipline as it relates to you know, trying to make sure that the coverage is in place so that if there is a loss, that the loss is covered versus having a member do the unthinkable of having to cover their own stuff? Sure. I mean, obviously, uh, JB, as a mutual company and more member owned, we want to make sure that we ensure all of our members' exposures and we want to make sure that they have the coverage that they need um, so that uh, any claim that occurs, whether it's property or liability, um, is handled in a way that's straightforward and easy and um, not, not problematic. What we don't want to have is a situation where a member has inadequate limits of insurance, meaning that they become uh, a potential self-insurer in the case of a building or in the case of general liability or a liability coverage that they don't have the limits that they need or in fact any coverage that they need because we simply weren't aware of it. So we really do want to make sure that we are getting giving them the right coverage that they need in a, in a, in a, on a sustainable basis over the long term. Okay, well, I get that and and I you know I'm hoping that our members are going to get the importance uh, of making sure that that uh, application is both complete with all information and that so that you guys in the underwriting division can make sure that you have all of the things you need to be 
you that you need in order to make a uh, an assessment and a decision on providing the best coverage for the member. So I'd like to move on and I, I understand that with, there is one other scenario and I think Jen's going to help us out with that one. Um, help me understand, Jen, going out to market, what does that mean for me? If we in-house are not able to provide a coverage for you, the account services department will go out to one of our partners and obtain the coverage for you. It could be an um, excess liability policy, a cyber policy, um, any professional liability policies, builder's risk policies. When we go out to market, it is important that, this is another reason it's important to let us know what you're doing because when we have to go out to one of our partners, the process is longer. So we need time to get the information to our brokers, our partners, so that they can go out and find the best market for you. So if it's delayed and you're waiting on a closing or you have like tentative dates to have things done, we can't turn a around as quickly as we could if we were working with our in-house underwriters. So I always ask, as soon as you have a plan to do something, and you go make that application to HUD and say, we want to do some construction, we want to do some renovation, we want to do a RAD project, that you also contact your account executive, because this puts us on alert. And if we have to go out and obtain other coverage for you, we have enough time to do it. If there's lenders involved, that brings up another issue because they're going to want to see proof of insurance prior to moving on with the process. So the sooner you contact us, the more we can, more time we have to work on getting you what you need. I want to interrupt for just a second because you said something that just days ago came across my desk um, where from a risk control standpoint and, and we uh, found that a member uh, was engaged in a project where they um, probably and more than likely should have uh, gotten with the, the account executive to talk about builder's risk. What are the the, the, the caveats, um, if you will, how, how would I as a member know to uh, reach out? What kinds of questions should I ask even a contractor that may want to do work on a building um, that, you know, I have that's occupied? How, how do I even get to the point where I'm going to call you? How does that work? Well, to me, no matter what the extent of your project is, if you have construction going on, whether there's people in the building, out of the building, your call should be to your account executive from the beginning. Like I said, it could be something small and you don't think it is going to impact your insurance, but it could. You, well, you know, your risk control, you see these things happen. We can help you get the right coverage if you just call us and let us know what's going on say jennifer we have this plan we're going out to bid for a contractor this is what we're going to write in the contract these are this is the scope of work you know here's a narrative of what we're doing if you provide us with that timely then we can direct you on okay let us go out to market and find a product that's really going to fit your project or talk to our underwriters here to see if it's something that we could possibly fit into our program. But if you don't let us know, and you have all these things going on, maybe there's some things in our policy that say that type of construction may not be covered. Or we're only willing to give you a limited amount because this is what the policy says. But if you let us know ahead of time, we can direct you on the best product for you, so. So it, it really sounds like that communications piece, again, is so very important and vital to even protecting a, a member from uh, doing something that they think and, and believe could be 
to be right, but in fact, it could put them in a situation where now they're going to have to answer the difficult question, am I covered for this claim? Yes. Okay, I apologize for interrupting you. I, no, I appreciate okay. the input. Go on, uh, you, you, you're welcome to go on with what you were speaking, speaking of, I'm sorry. Well, that was pretty much it. I just wanna stress the importance of communication with the your account executive. We're here to help you, even if we're not the department that you need to talk to, if you need to talk to the risk control department and you don't know who that person is, we'll gladly, you know, steer you to the right direction. You have questions, don't hesitate to call us even if you think it's the smallest thing because sometimes small things end up really not being small things. So just my takeaway from our whole webinar today is how important it is to reach out to us no matter what's going on um, in your agency because things that don't seem like issues can end up an issue and we wanna protect you from that. So now that we understand what, you know, comes from some of the things that you guys have actually encountered, real live stuff, this is not made up, this is actual, and I know Phil's situation because he actually called me to, to kind of make sure we were, what we were dealing with. Um, so I get that these are very real scenarios that we want to try to weed out and get past. So... For anyone that's uh, on this, uh, in watching this, there will be a link in the video description so that you can access uh, where and how to communicate with your account services rep, your, your claims uh, to report a claim, or even get in touch with a claims representative. You can get in touch with uh, folks from risk control, um, and, and all of that information will be located with a link in the description portion of this video. So if you are someone on this, uh, watching this particular tutorial um, and you um, are not familiar with the Risk Management Center, we have attached uh, in the description of this particular video, a link for you to watch a really short um, video segue into how to navigate through the Risk Management Center, which will help give you um, so much more information uh, and, and really put some things at your fingertips to help you um, communicate with risk control and to perhaps even use some of the, re uh, the resources that we have available um, as a part of the, the, the risk management center. So it's just important for you to understand that, again, we have taken the time deliberately to make sure that you as a member of this uh, with HAI, that you have that access uh, to get the, the types of resources uh, and programs and you know even some tools that can help you to mitigate and reduce those exposures and risks that your organization may be faced with. Again, I'd like to take a, a moment just to say thanks for everyone who took the time to uh, watch this video through. Um, myself, J.B. Smith, my information is uh, listed uh, at the top here. Um, Jennifer, um, beautiful done a fantastic job and and i i can't say enough that she is so knowledgeable of what we do here with hai uh, from an, an account executive perspective she is going to be a good point of contact and all of our account executives are uh, phenomenal uh, in making sure that they uh, either uh, provide you uh, with the information that you're looking for or actually uh, make that connection point to the people within the organization that can uh, that are best suited to uh, provide you the service that you're looking uh, looking for at that time. So again, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the folks that are behind the scenes assisting with this video. And again, remember to look in the description for this video for all of the links uh, and supporting information.